continue our Stewardship 2012 Lay Preacher Series this morning, um, hearing a sermon by Jamie Anderson. Jamie is a professor at, of chemistry at Santa Monica College and has been a member of Epiphany since 2005, confirmed 2010, I think? Yep. So, um, and Jamie sings with our parish choir and scola and is often our cantor. And we're going to have a little taste of um, Jamie's beautiful voice later on in the service. But now we get to hear his wonderful sermon. So please join me in welcoming Jamie. Thank you, Melissa, for inviting me to do this. Easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to go to heaven. I, I still remember the first time I heard this text as a child, being from a fundamentalist, uh, literalistic, biblically literalistic church. I thought somehow that God merely needed to shrink the rich man and his camels down so they could walk together through the eye of the needle, like in Honey, I Shrunk the Kids or some other kind of movie like that. What is it really about being rich? What are the stereotypes of a rich person? Do these stereotypes apply to us? We've certainly been hearing a lot about them in this election season. Are the rich attached to their possessions at the expense of others? Consumerists, unable to see the gap between themselves and others, between themselves and their service providers? between themselves and an employee who must lose their job for the corporate good. Unable to see the gap between their own upbringing and that of a person from another background with less privileges, less income, less education, less advantages. Or perhaps the rich are just way too full of themselves. These are the stereotypes. We've been talking a lot about wealth, class warfare, entitlement, middle class, upper class, working class, 1%, 99%, potent talk in a tough economy. But what is the link between all this talk of the haves and the have-nots and spiritual privilege? Can these income gaps really be counted against us when it comes to the judgment of God? And how can poverty entitle us to be among God's favor uh, entitle us to the kingdom of heaven. I think this gospel lesson must be about a deeply personal thing, an internal state of being that gives the erroneous impression that somehow I made all this, I deserve this. Or something that makes us think we can look at others and make snap judgments about them based on their apparent uh, success or lack of success, and often then go on to make comparisons between ourselves and others. Jesus was telling us that this state of being is profoundly antithetical to being open to God's grace in our lives. In the Old Testament reading today, Amos was a prophet speaking to Israel at a time when they were at a peak of their wealth, the greatest wealth since Solomon and David. Their enemies were busy fighting each other and the people of Israel were feeling pretty good about themselves. Their borders had expanded, but hard times were coming soon when the northern tribes of Israel would be completely conquered and wiped off the face of the earth. In our 2020 hindsight, we look down our noses at Israel in these stories. Why couldn't they see God working in their lives during the good times? Why did they only reconnect with God once they were conquered and captive? They say there are no atheists in foxholes, and it is certainly true that when we are in big trouble, our minds tend to go to God. During those hard times, during a crisis, or time of great stress or poverty, it can sometimes be easier to cry out to God then. The psalm for today asks God to make us glad by measuring the years in which we suffer adversity. But nevertheless, asks God to prosper our handiwork. What does examining our suffering have to teach us? It usually feels a lot easier to just forget it once it's over and move on with our lives. 
For me, the times of pain have helped, sometimes with much struggling, to notice how often I live my life with a false sense of being in full control. Living with a false sense that holding on tighter, being more vigilant in my own self-protection, that this will somehow make things turn out okay. During hardship and pain, I may find a place where I can realize that God has other plans for me. Maybe something scary, but ultimately better right around the corner. Maybe it's time for some personal growth, time to look at something important, something I am blinding myself to. Being in the middle of a crisis, feeling great need or want, this definitely gets all of our attentions. So this then is the balance we're being challenged to strike, to live our lives, both in times of plenty and in times of want, in the knowledge that God is there ready to heal us, to help us feel, to help us see what is really important in our lives, help us to stay in relationships with others, as Ryan so eloquently talked about last week. But it's pretty tough to keep that up once we're no longer under the gun. When our lives come back from a precipice, when we no longer have an immediate threat to our daily comforts. Amos, in his very harsh rebuke of Israel, clearly saw that the Israelites were feeling entitled to their prosperity. They fought hard to expand their borders, worked hard at making a stable political situation, and they totally had forgotten that God is the source of all goodness. And it's really easy to think like that when we're in a stable, uh, rich, content environment. It seems easy to assume that in stable and secure times, continuing to work hard will merely bring more success and more security, completely ignoring our relationships to others and blinding us to their needs in the process. Amos saw that Israel's apparently sweet situation that was bringing them new, new stone houses, pleasant vineyards, stockpiles of grain, was actually bitter on the spiritual level. Ah, you that turned justice into wormwood. Now, little science aside here, wormwood is a very bitter type of plant mentioned several places in the Bible. And as a science professor, I sometimes talk to my students about the five types of chemical sensors on our tongue, one of which senses bitterness. The others are sweetness, sourness, saltiness, and anybody know the last one? It's umami. Yes, ask me about it afterwards over coffee. <laughs> Scientists postulate that the bitterness sensor on our tongues has evolved over time as a warning of poison, since many, many deadly plant toxins have a bitter flavor. What this sensor, with, with this sensor, primitive humans were able to tell that something with a bitter flavor should best be left uneaten. But when your mouth is filled with rich food, it's kind of hard to taste that poison. In the movies, don't they always slip the deadly poison into a glass of champagne? If we just listen to our society's values, cutting out God, we believe that personal comfort and stability are signs of an inherent capacity to take care of things, to competently control all things. And this type of self-reliance separates us from our neighbors, who we are called to love as ourselves. After one very long work day, I was walking to my car, burdened with piles of exams and papers to grade, stressed out. I was feeling quite sorry for myself because I was going to lose my whole weekend to grading. And I noticed how my whole body, my whole state of being had tensed up. It was a familiar feeling, pretty self-absorbed feeling, really. It happened. Uh, it, I also happened at that moment to remember something Melissa had been talking about in her sermons about God calling us to relationship with God and with the people, with people in the world, the people in our lives. Listening for just a moment to that call, I saw the disparity between my post-work mindset and this calling. It was at that moment I saw two guys leaning up against their car uh, leaning up against a the back of a car at the parking lot entrance, looking rather helpless. Their car had broken down. They said a tow truck was coming, but they just needed to get the car out of the thoroughfare. 
and the two guys couldn't manage to push the car 